With the rollout of 5G cellular technology, the capabilities of our wireless networks continues to expand. Designing these advanced communication networks requires enormous engineering capability, but what considerations outside of RF technology should design engineers be taking into account? When we think of cellular network design as engineers, a lot of times the first thing our mind goes to is the complex wireless chipset that we're dealing with, the antenna design, or even the processors and software required to make today's complex telecom networks work. But what are some of the other aspects in design that we need to be taking into consideration, like our electromechanicals, the passives that we choose, the connectors that we choose in these high-speed designs so that the actual system can function properly? And are those considerations different than what we may see in the typical embedded design that we're working on every day? Uh, today, I have the privilege of speaking with Brian Donovan and Jeff Katz, product managers at Panasonic and experts in this area of technology. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today on The Current. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, Todd. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, so like I said, you know, I think when, when we think about doing a, a 5G network or any kind of a cellular network uh, as engineers, our mind kind of goes to those very, very complex systems, kind of the heart of the system. Um, but I know there are a lot of other considerations that we need to take into account. Uh, what are some of the things that when you're doing a 5G design, engineers should be thinking about from day one? Can we take this, Jeff, first? Sure. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so yeah, Todd, um, I think probably for capacitor side, I think the most key consideration for something like, uh, you know, a conductive polymer capacitor is long life at high temperature. Um, you know, often these capacitors are used in applications such as, you know, 5G base stations, which are often, you know, they're located outdoors. So um, you, you, you might have to have parts that withstand high temperatures for, you know, a long endurance. So yeah. some of our parts, you know, we have caps that can withstand, uh, up to 125 degrees C for 5,000 hours or, or, or more. Um, and a rule of thumb we use is that any, you know, 10 degree C drop in ambient temperature, um, actually will extend the life of the polymer cap by two times. Um, so in general, our engineers estimate that, you know, conductive polymer capacitors will last between like 15 to 20 years in these types of applications, okay. which is really good, um, you know, because, you know, a certain you know, customer might not want to replace any of the equipment for 15 to 20 years or longer. So, um, so that's a good thing about using a kind of a Panasonic polymer capacitor or a polymer capacitor in general. Um, and other considerations are, you know, low impedance, low ESR. Um, high capacitance and small case size. Um, you know, in reference to some of our polymer tantalum caps, which we call the POS cap, um, we have case sizes that are as small as 3.5 millimeter in length by 2.8 millimeter in width. So um, pretty small um, and it's great for keeping the overall board footprint very small in those designs. So um, I think those are the main considerations, you know, when choosing a, a, that type of capacitor. Absolutely, absolutely. And then anything like on the electromechanical side, any any thoughts on some of the considerations that need to be made there as well? Certainly. Um, first things that come to mind for me would be better signal integrity. That's always a must, particularly with these higher speed data rates. So you want to make sure that you have proper shielding in place that are going to allow for superior EMI. And also uh, robustness as well, and while still being able to keep a very small size. So miniaturization is definitely key in a lot of aspects. No question. Absolutely. And, and so, you, you know, as far as, you know, with capacitors going back to that, you know, obviously small size being a key component and, and going with a polymer that's going to be able to handle those, those temperature variations much better. Uh, what are some of the other characteristics when selecting a capacitor in these high speed networks uh, that's required? Um, I mean, again, it's it's usually, um, you know, low ESR, high capacitance, performance at high temperatures are kind of the main things um, that I kind of already you know, touched on. Yeah. Um, you know, you want these systems to maintain a consistent voltage across uh, a bunch of different operating frequencies, right? Um, so something like, you know, our products like the POS cap, which is polymer tantalum, um, the SP cap, which is a uh, polymer aluminum, and then the OSCON, mm -hmm. which is also a polymer aluminum. That's kind of our whole lineup. Um, all of those can help a design engineer meet that goal. Um, and that's primarily because you know, these products are very low impedance. 
Um, right. You know, and, and the the SP caps themselves, which are the aluminum polymers, they have very low ESR, as low as three milliohms. So that's pretty much as low as you can as you can really get with a lot of these uh, capacitors on the market today. Um, you know, if you're using kind of a aluminum lytic or a hybrid cap, usually the ESR is a little bit higher, not super high, but not it's not going to be as low as something that use, uses kind of a, an, a polymer electrolyte, right? right. Um, so I think those are the main considerations. Um, obviously with kind of the whole supply chain issues that we ha we're having nowadays, you, you got to think about um, pricing and also the amount of caps maybe you're using on a board. Um, and I can touch on that a little bit uh, later, but you know, um, you know, typically with, with the polymer capacitors, sometimes if you have an, an MLCC design where maybe you're using 12 MLCCs in an array, um, you can replace multiple MLCCs with one single polymer capacitor. So pricing is also, I, I think, a big consideration nowadays with a lot of, even engineers are obviously considering that. Um, uh, obviously the buyers and the purchasers that are you know, procuring these parts really care, but engineers also have to think about that as well in their design. So um, you know, replacing multiple you know, current products in a design like an MLCC with a polymer capacitor is actually very smart long-term in terms of a you know financial standpoint and things like that right it can really reduce the the, the volume of product needed so that, that's exactly. absolutely a yeah. phenomenal thing in this market as well um mm -hmm. as things continue to be a challenge and then i know like at panasonic relays are a big part of what you guys do as well um you know where do relays play in 5g networks uh, i know that's something that you guys have really spent a lot of time on where do you guys see the the benefit of your product in these kinds of networks and where is it being utilized so the relays is really being used at the back end here, uh, back at the data centers, and particularly for the power distribution units. Uh, some relays are also used in the uh, power supply units and also on automatic transfer equipment as well. Okay, okay. All right, so, and then what are the key considerations when you're looking at the relays for that? What makes a Panasonic relay a better option than some of the others out there? So Panasonic relays specialize in allowing for a really small size footprint uh, and that allows what's particularly good about having a small footprint in a power distribution unit, for example, is these boards have pretty high density mounting. Um, they can have up to 48 relays on a single board and that also generates a lot of heat. So oh, yeah. Panasonic relays allow you to uh, use less power consumption uh, through the through the use of latching. So rather than continuously energizing a coil, you just pulse the coil and it, the relay will maintain the uh, correct state. Also, these type of relays need to be able to withstand very high inrush currents. So yep. our, our uh, relays have uh, TV8 ratings, which is pretty much a need in this case. And mm -hmm. And to prolong the life of a relay in a power distribution unit, which, which is pretty important, uh, a lot of designers will want to implement zero cross circuitry. And so with the latching, uh, Panasonic has very good consistent turn on times for the closing of the contacts for set and reset. And that allows the end user to design a better zero cross circuit and really improve the long life capability of the relay. Right, right. So, so then back to more towards the front end and, and, and the actual wireless communication array in a 5G network. We're obviously dealing with much higher frequency ranges, uh, particularly with 5G, where the frequency that we're actually operating at is is, is much higher. Uh, what challenges does that bring into the embedded system when you're operating at, at that much higher frequency in terms of things like EMI and, and, and what design considerations engineers should be thinking about for maybe some of the other peripheral components in the system? Yeah, so I guess I'll take that first. Um, so for in, in terms of the kind of topic of capacitors, uh, for ICs that have higher switching frequencies, I think the low, very low impedance of our conductive polymer caps can help solve a lot of the noise issues, um, you know, and could be a solution EMI. Um, and obviously, you know, we see our polymer caps used in many, you know, e, uh, low pass filter designs to help mitigate EMI. So that's kind of one right. of their main purposes in those in those types of designs. So that, that would help it, it, it on in that topic of EMI. Absolutely. Okay. And, and on the connector side as well, uh, we yeah. have connectors that are designed for 50 ohm impedance matching. And we 
done testing up to 15 gigahertz frequency, although I, I think uh, 10 gigahertz is typically uh, sufficient for five millimeter wave antenna modules. Um, and we get voltage standing wave ratios under 1.5. And we, all, we have really good EMI protection uh, because we're able to get a metal shield insert molding inside the connector, which is able to isolate the high speed frequency signal pins. And we're able to do it in a very small size as well. Right. So you end up with a great form factor and, and also just, uh, you know, lower height restrictions as well from what you guys have to offer and, and also mitigating any, any potential EMI issues um, that we all want to make sure don't show up in our system before we design it. So that's right. Excellent. <clears throat> and then so, you know, the other thing I think when we we're talking about 5G or cellular, um, you know, it, it's one of those industries and one of those those areas of technology growth that is part of the factor that's causing a lot of the allocation. Um, you know, we talk about electric vehicles, we talk about, you know, just the, the need for more and more servers, but also the expansion of the 5G networks out there are also taking a lot of the semiconductor supply. Um, what can engineers do to give their companies the best possible chance to get product for their designs in these 5G applications? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll speak a little bit on the kind of global supply situation first. Um, Personally, like I handle multiple product lines of capacitors, so I'm very involved in trying to always expedite product, you know, for our, you know, our customers uh, and distributors, you know, such as Future. Um, you know, right now, most of the customers that I talk to on a daily basis, they're just trying to find parts, um, yeah. you know, so they don't have to push their production schedules out, which a lot of our customers have been forced to do due to the semiconductor shortages and things like that. Um, you know, currently we're seeing a lot of demand from 5G, from automotive and mobility, security, consumer markets. Um, and, you know, our supply for capacitors is most tight on the aluminum lytic and the hybrids. But it seems like with the polymer caps, um, you know, supply is not as tight and we have a little bit more kind of consistent you know, production schedule. Um, and like, you know, for the polymers, you know, we're currently seeing some of the, the pos caps, the, the polymer tantalums that are at about 25 weeks lead time. Um, SP caps, which are the polymer aluminums, are at about 39 week lead times, so a little bit longer. And then the OSCONs, which are also the aluminum polymer, but they're in the sort of form factor of like the can type, which is more like an aluminum lytic um, form factor. Those are at about 20 weeks. Um, so for a lot of customers that are using currently maybe a, a hybrid cap or an aluminum lytic, they're actually moving over to a polymer cap because the lead times are much shorter. Um, and, and that's what a lot of these you know, buyers and even engineers are considering in some new designs, a lot of them are having to redesign their boards to use maybe a polymer capacitor instead of a lytic. Um, but the right now, the polymers, I think, are in a much better position than any other capacitor uh, on the market, uh, including MLCCs. I mean, you look at MLCC oh, yeah. lead time is also very long as well. No question. Um, so, so as I was kind of saying before, MLCCs, you know, them being maybe like a, a one year lead time, you might be able to replace several MLCCs with one particular, you know, um, pause cap, which is 25 week lead time. So, you know, that that's one of the considerations. Uh, I mean, supply chain and, you know, logistics is just kind of a mess right now. Um, everything is, uh, logistics is, is expensive. Everything is delayed. You look at all like the boat delays that are happening. Um, but our, it seems like our factories, um, you know, in Indonesia and Singapore and stuff like that for the polymer caps, they're making heavy investments into that technology. So we're going to see as time goes on in, in our, uh, you know, in calendar 2022, you'll see the lead times for polymers decrease. You might not see that maybe on the aluminum lytic side because there's just such high demand from automotive yeah. right now, but you'll see kind of some of the lead times for polymers decrease. And I think there's going to be a little bit of a boom, um, you know, for, you know, interest in the polymer capacitors. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I guess on the other topic of MLCCs, them being such a long lead time, you know, I guess the advantage, uh, I would say, um, that polymer caps have over MLCCs, MLCCs are a lot smaller, obviously, in package size. But like I said, you can replace multiple MLCCs, say, you know, maybe five or six on the board with one particular polymer. And that's because the polymer caps or our polymer caps do not have to be derated. MLCCs, sometimes you have to derate the voltage, you have to derate the capacitance, maybe 60, 70 percent, and then use multi multiple of those to get to 
um, you know, a, 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 a target capacitance or nominal capacitance, right? Right. With a polymer cap, you do not have to derate those. So that's why they're a perfect replacement for those long lead time MLCCs. And, you know, if you only have to wait 25 weeks for a part, perfect. You can adjust your production schedule as a customer and get product out to your customers a lot quicker. So right. um, I think that's one of the considerations with the whole supply chain impact is just kind of a major mess right now with a lot of passive components. And I think electromechanical to a point, right? Um, but yeah, that's what a lot of customers are, are considering, you know, board redesigns, respins, and just using different types of passives to replace other components that they have on their board. Right. So, right. Yeah. No question. No question. So, yeah, comment. And then uh, also on the connector side, yeah. uh, lead times are terrific for this product as long as uh, yep. we get, I mean, for any really large quantities, as long as you work with us and uh, let us know forecasts, uh, we're generally pretty good. But uh, lead times tend to be around 12 weeks for connectors, which is pretty good in the way the market is right now. I'm speaking this as of middle of May. Uh, 2022, in case this gets dated. Um, and yeah. also, um, <laughs> going back to the relay side, uh, so the most popular relay in our product portfolio is this DW series. And our factory is actually investing in production capacity for the DW. We actually created a second production line. And lead times are terrific right now at DW. So we're looking at around 12 weeks lead time. Okay. All right. Not a lot of products can say that these days. So, so that's, that's definitely handy. Uh, you know, I, again, I think, you know, the best thing with any of those products, even in the 12 week lead time, 26 week lead time in this market, communication is key, right? Um, you know, the, the more I think that we can communicate start pipelining product for engineers out there, the better that we're all going to end up and, 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 and able to make deadlines for product builds, um, you know, or the earlier, the better, um, is, is tends to be the, uh, the rule of thumb, I think in the industry right now. So, mm -hmm. but Brian, Jeff, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I really appreciate the insights you know, I, I think when, when you're doing a 5g design, there's so many more considerations, um, you know, that, that we've got to take into account. Panasonic certainly has a lot of great options in this. Thanks also to our audience for listening and really appreciate you joining us on another episode of the current. Um, if you have questions in your designs when it comes to uh, any any high uh, frequency designs whether they're 5g or otherwise um, or anything else where we can make introductions between you and, and panasonic uh, or, or any of the other technical needs that you may have please reach out to us at shaping the future at futureelectronics.com again that's shaping the future at futureelectronics.com we would absolutely love to get our engineers working alongside you and helping you be successful in your product designs. Thanks again so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on The Current.